Hey everybody, this is Russ from Retro Game Core. Now it's hard to believe, but this device here, the RJ351V, has been out for a couple months now. And believe it or not, I'm just now sitting down to do an in-depth review of this device. And honestly, I really didn't plan on doing a review because my impressions video was so comprehensive. But a lot of people keep asking me about this device, how I feel about it now that I've had it for a while. And I've kind of gone nuts with this thing. I've actually bought all three colors, and I've been enjoying the heck out of them. So in today's video, we're going to do a deep dive into this device, talk about all the things I love about it, all the things that I don't really love about it, and to kind of help guide you towards a decision of whether or not this is a device that's a good fit for you. It seems like every day there are more and more options available to you, and so I'm hoping with this review is to give you a really good solid idea of whether or not the RG351V in particular is going to be worth your time and money. Now the chipset that powers this device has been around for a while, years at this point. And I know a lot of people are getting burnt out with devices like this. But I do think there is enough uniqueness to this device that warrants a really good in-depth analysis. And so that's what we're going to do here today. As always, I'm going to try my hardest to keep this under 30 minutes, no promises. But definitely grab your beverage of choice, maybe a kombucha, a Capri Sun, whatever it happens to be. And let's get the party started. So without any further delay, here we go. Okay, so just in case you're not familiar with this device and its technical specifications, let's knock those out real quick. This device runs on the RK3326 quad-core chipset, which can run at a clock speed of up to 1.5 gigahertz. And it has one gig of DDR3 RAM. Now the most unique feature of this device is this OCA laminated display. It's 3.5 inches in a 4 by 3 aspect ratio with a 640 by 480 resolution. This is a perfect screen for retro gaming because a lot of the original systems ran at this aspect ratio. The device has a 3900 milliamp hour battery, which will last for about 6 hours. The device has an internal Wi-Fi chip and retails for 110 US dollars. Now a lot of these specs probably don't mean anything to you, and that's totally fine. Let's talk about the real world context of this performance. So what you see on the screen here are all the systems that are run just about perfectly on this device. So anything from the 8-bit era, 16-bit era, basically anything from the 80s and early 90s are going to run great. Everything up to PlayStation 1. When it comes to arcade, for the most part, 80s and early 90s games are also going to work really well. So all in all, most of the systems that would really benefit from this screen in particular run really well on this device. And I think that's a pretty exciting balance between hardware specs and visual fidelity. Now this device can also play some other systems which you see here on the screen, but performance is not going to be as good. In general, when it comes to this chipset, I tell people not to have high expectations for any of these systems, but to treat it like an added bonus. That way it's a pleasant surprise when one of these games works, and you're not disappointed when they don't. Okay, moving on to the unboxing experience. The device comes in a pretty plain box here, as you can see. And inside you're going to get the device as well as some accessories. Let's check those out first. You're going to get a USB-C charging cable, the glass screen protector, as well as some instruction manuals. Now this device comes in three colors. This one's called the smoke black version. As you can see, it's faintly transparent. I think it's a very nice look. The device is somewhat on the big side, it weighs about 225 grams altogether. But all in all, it's a very well built device. Let's take a look at some of these buttons. We'll start with the D-pad. So the D-pad on this device is what I call mushy. It has a rubber membrane underneath the plastic part, which gives it a very classic and retro feel to it. It reminds me a lot of an NES gamepad. Now compare that to something like the Nintendo 3DS, which is a very clicky D-pad. You can see how little travel there is when you push on the button. Now the Nintendo Switch Lite actually has a little bit more travel to it. This one actually feels really good as a D-pad. Now something like the PS Vita is not like that. It has a little bit of travel to it, but it's also a clicky D-pad like the 3DS. Now compared to a Super Nintendo controller, you can see it has the same amount of travel, but this controller doesn't pivot very well. You can see when you push down on the bottom part that the top and the sides also push down a little bit as well. The 351V does not have this problem. It pivots pretty well. Now here's the PS4 D-pad. It also has a good amount of travel, but I kind of don't like how the D-pad feels like four separate buttons on this controller. Now the Xbox One controller has the same kind of cross pattern, but it's also very clicky, a lot like the Nintendo 3DS. So all in all, the D-pad on the RG351V feels really good. It has a nice classic feel to it. 
and I think it's really fitting for the types of games you're going to be playing on it. Now let's talk about the analog stick for a second. This is basically the same as the Nintendo Switch analog stick. And it's pretty far recessed into the case, but luckily it does not press against the sides of the case. So there's no restriction of movement here. Looking at the Nintendo Switch Lite, you can see that it's not as recessed into the case, but it also sticks out quite a lot. I like the 351V analog stick better. In terms of face buttons, these buttons are very bouncy and responsive. I really like them. They also have a classic retro feel to them. It reminds me a lot of pushing on old game pads as a kid. So when it comes to the nostalgia factor, Ambernic really nailed it on these. And these are almost the exact same buttons that you'll find across all of the Ambernic devices. Honestly, they're just really good buttons. Let's do some measurements. They're about 8 millimeters across. Now compare that to something like the PS Vita, which is 6.8 millimeters or the Xbox One, or even PS4 controller, which are a little bit more than 10 millimeters. So at eight millimeters, it's kind of a middle ground between some of the smaller handhelds and a console size controller. Now the other buttons you're gonna find on the face of the device have the exact same feel as the face buttons themselves. The buttons are made out of a hard plastic, but they're bouncy and responsive. And I should note as well that this single analog stick also clicks down, so you have an L3 button. Now obviously this device does not have dual analog sticks, Instead, they put a single mono speaker there. And I'm sure the reason why they did that is to keep that kind of nostalgic Game Boy feel to everything. But honestly, the form factor of this device wouldn't feel very comfortable playing with dual analog setup anyway. So I think Ambernet actually went in the right direction when it comes to this control scheme. Sure, I would have loved to have stereo speakers, but I understand why they went this route. After all, they are replicating a classic console like the Game Boy. On the bottom, you have two USB-C ports, one for charging, one for peripherals as well as a headphone jack. And on the back, you can see they have these three little grooves here. And initially you might think, hey, this is a place to put your fingers, but no fingers are gonna fit in there. I think it's just there for cosmetics. On the right here, you can see it has two SD card slots, one for your system and the other for your games. This is the only device on the market with this chipset and two SD cards like this. I think it's really handy. And finally, on the back, you can see that there are a series of shoulder buttons here. L1 and L2, R1 and R2. Now the L2 and R2 buttons are slightly raised over the other buttons. And naturally I find that my index fingers want to push those ones first. And there's no real way to comfortably cover both of those buttons with two fingers. So what you end up doing is using one single finger to kind of cover both of them. And so you use the middle of your index fingers to push the R1 and L1 buttons. And honestly, it's kind of a shame because those are the buttons you're going to push more often with classic consoles. Think about the Super Nintendo, it only had L1 and R1. Same thing with the DS. And so in that context, it's a little bit weird because your fingers want to push the L2 and R2 buttons first, but in game, you're actually going to use the other ones instead. So you either have to get used to using the middle of your fingers to push down on these buttons, or you kind of have to hold your index fingers at a hook angle in order to get the outside buttons. I personally don't find it to be a very comfortable position over long periods of gaming. Another issue I've struggled with for the past couple months is where to put my fingers while I'm playing the game. Part of me naturally wants to just interlace my fingers behind it, but there's not enough space to do that. You can see that my pinkies just kind of flail around at the bottom here. Now another way you could hold the device is to kind of ball your fists together. And that feels pretty comfortable initially, but over time as I'm playing, my fingers naturally just want to spread out a little bit. They don't want to be scrunched up like that while I'm playing. I think just overall, this form factor in general is not as comfortable as something that's in a horizontal form factor like the RG351P. But personally, I found that if I'm playing for less than an hour at a time, the ergonomics of this device doesn't really bother me at all. But if you like to play with long gaming sessions, that's something you should think about. Up on the top left, you can see there are some volume buttons. They're very clicky and kind of uncomfortable to push. For example, when you're holding the device itself and you're trying to turn the volume up or down, it just kind of jostles the whole device against your other finger. It's not a very pleasant experience. It would have been really nice if they had used a volume wheel instead, like they did on the RG351P and the RG351M. On the right side, you have a reset button, which I actually have never used, and then a power button to turn the device on. When you turn the device off, you want to actually do it in the software. When it comes to branding, they have an Ambernic logo here on the back. And if you're not a fan of this sticker here, you can actually buy replacement stickers from the Etsy store called Sakura Retro Modding. Now on the front, there's also an Ambernic logo and that same Etsy store sells other stickers that you can use to cover that as well. Okay, let's talk about texture for a second. This smoke model in particular has a kind of gritty texture to it. 
I actually really like the feel of it. It feels really solid in my hands. Now, like I mentioned before, this device actually comes in three different colors. In the middle here is one that they just call gray. And then on the left, they have one that's called wood grain. And it's not made of actual wood, it's just plastic. Now, these two colors are much more smooth than the smoke one. And that can be a good or a bad thing, depending on what you like. Personally, I think the smoke texture is the best. And I also like how it's translucent, although honestly, I wish they had gone all the way and just made it like clear translucent. That would have been really cool looking. Now, the gray one was actually the one that I requested from the company initially, but it turns out that I found it kind of boring once I got it in the hands. So I ended up doing a hardware mod on this device and changing out the buttons for more colorful buttons. And I really liked making that transformation. But believe it or not, the one that I thought was the dumbest out of all three is actually now my favorite. I really like this wood one. It's just so audacious and stupid, you know, like it's just ridiculous. Who decided to make a wooden plastic device? But sure enough, here I am two months later and this one's my favorite. So when it actually comes down to it, I'm going to give the gray and the smoke one away to two close friends of mine. I never thought in a million years that I'd be the one keeping the wood grain one. But it's just so distinct and funny that I want to keep it for myself. Okay, so let's boot up these devices and let's talk a little bit about the firmware options that are available to you. On the left, we're going to boot up ArcOS, in the middle is 351 Elec, and on the right is going to be the stock operating system that comes with the device. Now each of these look very different from one another, but most of that has to do with the themes that they're using. They all use the same emulation station front end. So in general, the way that you navigate through these systems and pick your games and play your games is actually very similar. And I go into way more detail in my 351V custom firmware guide, which I encourage you to check out. But for now, I just really want to say that the custom firmware is available on ArcOS, 351 Elec, and even the Retro Arena are miles better than the ones that come with the device. So if you do decide to buy one of these devices, I would just keep it in the back of your mind that it's a really good idea to install one of these other firmwares instead, because they're being updated all the time with new tweaks and features, and the performance on them is actually way better than it is on the stock firmware as well. So once you buy the device, go ahead and check out my custom firmware guide to figure out which one is the best fit for you. And honestly, the stock experience isn't terrible, but once you move over to a custom firmware, you'll know what I'm talking about. Okay, before we get into actual gameplay, I want to spend a few minutes talking about the screen of this device. Like I mentioned before, this is a 640x480 display running at a 4x3 aspect ratio. And that aspect ratio is going to be just great for a lot of these home consoles like the Nintendo, Super Nintendo, Genesis, stuff like that. But aspect ratio is really only one of two factors to think about when you're talking about a really nice screen image. The other factor is the screen resolution. Now let me show you what I mean. The original NES actually ran at a 256 by 240 pixel resolution. So if you end up going into the emulator settings and turning on integer scaling, that's going to scale that original resolution up to the maximum size that'll fit inside of this screen. And given this is a 640 by 480 resolution screen, that means it's going to be a 2x integer scale. And unfortunately, that's not going to fill up the entire screen. As you can see here, there are these small black borders around the edges of the screen. And that's not a big deal. The Nintendo games look just fine like this. But if you want to take advantage of that whole screen, you're going to want to turn off integer scaling, which is going to cause some pixel distortions in the image. And they're really faint, and you're probably not going to notice them. I really can't. But if you want to have a full screen image while still having really nice and balanced pixels, you're going to want to use something called shaders. And that's also available in the emulator settings. You just go into the shaders section, and then you load up a shader. I like to use one that's in the interpolation folder, and it's called Sharp Bilinear 2x Prescale. All you have to do is just activate this shader and then go back into the game. And this is what it's going to look like here. It basically has perfectly balanced pixels as well as taking up the full screen. It's the best of both worlds. Now let me give you an example where you can actually see the difference. Here we are running the Super Nintendo game Mega Man X in a full screen image without integer scaling on. And if you look at Mega Man's life bar here, you can see these two thick black bars, which are an indication that you have unbalanced pixels. So if we go into the settings and we turn on integer scaling, that's going to make the image a little bit smaller, but it's going to fix that pixel distortion. And as you can see here, now you can see the entire life bar, no big thick black bars. And sure, you're going to have these small bezels around the edges of the screen, but they're kind of not noticeable. But same thing here, if we want to have that full screen image, we're going to turn off integer scaling, we're going to go into the shader settings, 
and we're going to pick that exact same sharp bilinear 2x prescale shader again. And just like that, we have a full screen image without having any of that pixel distortion. Now, full disclosure, this will make the image just a little bit softer. But again, it's almost impossible to see that difference. If you can see that difference, you got some really good eyes. Now, I know I went really quickly through all that. I really am just trying to give you examples here. But in my video description, I'll leave a link to my guide, which will walk you through this entire process. It's really not as intimidating as it might look. Okay, let's move over to one more example, this time for Game Boy and Game Boy Color. Now these two systems are unique because they do not have a native 4x3 aspect ratio. These devices used a 10x9 aspect ratio, which is basically a square image. And if you turn on integer scaling using the original aspect ratio like you see here, you're going to get a little bit thicker bezels around your image here. And honestly, in this context, I don't really mind them because it reminds me a lot of the original Game Boy, which as you can see here had very large bezels. So you could probably just play it like this and have that integer scaling going on. Or you could use something like overlays, which will really just kind of ramp up this whole experience. And I have an entire guide for this on my channel already, which will walk you through how all these overlays work. But as you can see here, you can use an overlay that'll actually look like the original Game Boy on your device. And that's a pretty cool experience. And the artist who created these overlays also made a couple extra ones. For example, here's the Game Boy Light one. And then he also made a unique red one as well. So these are kind of neat, right? Really, when it comes down to it for Game Boy and Game Boy Color, you have three different options. You can either just make it full screen and it's just going to be a little bit wider than usual. You can make it the original aspect ratio like you see here, or you can use an overlay to really ramp up that experience. And even though I don't really mind these big bezels, I also kind of like having it at full screen as well. And obviously it's a little bit stretched looking in this way, but it's just so impressive to have a big old screen like this in 2021 on an original Game Boy experience. Okay, one last handheld system to talk about, the Game Boy Advance. This one had a native aspect ratio of 3x2, which is a little bit wider than 4x3. And so because of that, you're going to have bezels at the top and bottom. Now the way the resolution works on this device versus the original, you're not going to want to use integer scaling. Look at how big these bezels are. So in this case, your best bet is to use non-integer scaling and then use a shader to give you that right pixel balance. While I have the Game Boy Advance up, let's talk a little bit about the 351P. Now the 351P actually had a 3x2 aspect ratio, and it's an exact 2 times scale for the Game Boy Advance. So it works really well when it comes to Game Boy Advance games. But comparing these two devices side by side, I actually like the coloring on the 351V a lot better. The colors are much more vibrant, and there's just a better contrast available on this screen. All in all, the 351V is one of the best screens you can find on any of these devices. And this is a really good example here of how much better it is. So even though the 351P is kind of made for Game Boy Advance, the Game Boy Advance games actually look better on the 351V. Now that's just my personal preference, but let me know in the comments below what you think. Alright, now let's actually talk about gameplay performance. Now when it comes to 8-bit, 16-bit systems, things like Nintendo, Super Nintendo, Genesis, they all run flawlessly. Don't even worry about performance on this device. Even things like Sega CD, Sega 32X, they're going to run just great. Same thing with PlayStation 1, even the hardest games to play are still going to run at a solid 60 frames per second. Now when it comes to arcade games, they're all going to play just fine. As long as you stick to arcade games from the 80s and early 90s, you're going to have a great time. So all the classic beat em ups and fighting games and things like that, they're going to play just fine on this device. Now one thing to mention, some of those classic games that ran with a vertical screen like Donkey Kong aren't going to look so hot on this device. With something like the RG351P and the RG351M, you can actually rotate the display to play these games vertically. You don't have that luxury here on this device. Not a huge deal, but I wanted to point it out. Now moving on to some of the harder to emulate systems, Nintendo DS works fairly well on this device. What I really like about Nintendo DS on this system in particular is that the original screens ran at 4x3 as well, which means they look just great on this device. I've actually been playing through the first Phoenix Wright game for the probably the past like six months or so, and I moved my save file over from my older device onto the 351V because I really like playing this game at night and this device is just like the perfect fit. So I think that says something about the 351V. If I'm comfortable moving my save files over from other devices onto this one, that means this one's a keeper. 
Now, a Nintendo 64 gameplay is hit or miss. It really depends on what firmware you're using. Personally, I like to use Arc OS when it comes to Nintendo 64. That firmware has some of the best performance on this device. You can see here F-Zero X is playing at basically full screen using the standalone Moopin emulator. Now, it's not going to fix everything. For example, here's Cruising USA using that same standalone emulator. And the performance is not great, as you can see. But when it comes down to it, I think that if you're using Arc OS on this device in particular, you're going to be able to get good gameplay for about half of the Nintendo 64 games in the catalog. And those aren't bad odds, really. Now Dreamcast is one of those systems that actually is starting to run really well on this chipset. And just like with Nintendo 64, Arc OS has the best Dreamcast performance too. Now just to show you both ends of the spectrum here, yes games like Jet Set Radio are going to play fine, but other games like Dead or Alive 2 are not going to play at full speed. And that just kind of comes to the territory, some games play better than others. Now moving over to PSP, in general PSP performance is not going to be super good when it comes to this device, but it really depends on the game, just like with the other systems. For example you can see I'm playing Ridge Racer with an auto frame skip of 1 and it's running relatively smoothly. But on the other end of that spectrum, OutRun 2006 is just about unplayable on this device. So to get good PSP performance, it's going to take some experimentation on your part, but again, I would say about half of the games in the catalog are going to be decently playable. Okay, for this next segment, we're going to start wrapping up here. I'm going to talk real quickly about some of the reasons why you should think about getting the RG351V, and some of the reasons why you might think about passing on this device in particular. So the first reason to maybe think about getting this device is its incredible display. This 4x3 aspect ratio, running at 640x480, it just looks beautiful. Number two, the form factor is very nostalgic and a lot of fun. So if you grew up with a Game Boy or a Game Boy Color, this is going to be right up your alley. And we have a really good balance between the power of the device and the types of games that it can play. And this form factor and chipset are perfectly aligned for retro gaming. So it really hits it out of the park when it comes to that. And lastly, this device is actually getting very popular and a lot of people are really excited about it. Which probably means in the months to come we're going to see even more development and unlock features for this device. Now some reasons to maybe think about passing on this device. Number one is ergonomics. It doesn't feel very good to play for a long term session. I can only play this device for about an hour before my hands start to hurt. And surprisingly, this device is actually a little bit on the big side. It's a great fit for putting in a bag or a backpack but it's not something you could comfortably fit in your jeans unless you're wearing Jinkos. And if that's the case, you and I need to have a talk. Next, I think that this chipset is at the end of its life cycle. By the end of this year, we're probably going to see devices that are going to have more powerful chipsets inside of them. And finally, if you already have an RK3326 device, I'm not quite convinced that $110 is worth it to you to upgrade if you already have a device. Now all that being said, if you don't already own a retro handheld device, or you're looking to add to your collection, the RG351V is a really excellent choice. It's got one of the best screens you can find on any of these devices, it's full of nostalgia, and it's really well made. But if you're going to consider this device, I recommend you also consider a couple others, starting with the RG351P. This one is $15 cheaper and comes with dual analog sticks, and it's really great for Game Boy Advance gameplay thanks to its 3x2 aspect ratio. That being said, the device doesn't have Wi-Fi, so that's important to you, the 351V might be worth it. Now if you're thinking about the 351P, you might as well think about the PAL Giddy RGB10 as well. This device runs for about $20 cheaper than the 351P, but runs the exact same chipset and is way more pocketable too. Now my device here actually has a metal shell and a Vita analog stick, I've done a bunch of upgrades to this, but if you are looking for an entry handheld device, I think this should be on your radar too especially considering that it's about $35 cheaper than the 351V. Lastly, another one to think about is the PAL Kitty RGB10 Max. This one has a beautiful big 5 inch display, dual analog sticks, internal Wi-Fi, but it costs about $10 more than the 351V. These all have the same chipset in them, so they're going to have the same exact performance. But at the end of the day, all things considered, is the RG351V worth $110? After two months with this device, I can tell you unequivocally that it definitely is worth it. And sure, I have my complaints about it when it comes to the ergonomics and the lack of stereo sound, but by far, I think that the positives outweigh the negatives. I wouldn't go as far as saying this is my favorite device out of all the ones I own, and it all depends on the context, but I will say this is definitely a contender for my favorite device. And that's not something I really considered a couple months ago, and I think that you'll grow to love it as well if you get your hands on one.
All right, everyone, that's it for this video. Let me know if you have any questions in the comments below, and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful. And we will see you next time. Happy gaming.